Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the 40 Orty podcast. It has been a little bit of a while. I hope that the festive period, the festive times haven't been too hard on you all. I know it can be a bit stressful, especially with all of the social events and stuff going on. But we're back again for another episode. And today we're talking to Emily from 21 and Sensory. How are you doing, Emily? Hi, um, I'm good, thanks. Have you had a pretty good holiday season? Yeah, it's been really nice, actually. It's been good to have a break from work. I had like two weeks off, so I've just been starting to get back into work this week, which has been a little bit difficult, you know, forgetting how to log into the routine. Yeah, (laughs) all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Yeah. but no, it was good, thanks. Cool. Uh, So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, uh, maybe at work and what you do on like Instagram and your podcasts and stuff? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, my name is Emily. Um, I'm 25, but I started um, my blog and Instagram when I was 21. So that's why um, I'm kind of known as 21 and Sensory on sort of social media. Um, So I have sensory processing disorder, which is also sort of known and referred to as SPD. Um, I am autistic as well and I was recently diagnosed so in November 2019 which is just gone Um, so a little bit more about me and my background I also have um, anxiety and sort of episodes of depression and when I was at university I found out that I have um, severe dyslexia so um, I was assessed um, in my first year at uni and uh, told I was dyslexic when I was 19 Um, so in terms of all my sensory sort of stuff Um, an occupational therapist so an OT diagnosed me with my sensory processing disorder when I was in primary school Um, so I'm in the UK so um, I think that I was around sort of age eight Um, I've tried a lot of sort of different therapies such as like CBT so cognitive behavioral therapy and also therapy sessions within the NHS so um, within CAMS which is the child and adolescence mental health Mm -hmm. service Um, but I've also tried some self like funded private therapy sessions as well. Um, but overall I've always found that, um, occupational therapy has been the best sort of therapy for me. Um, so I was on an NHS waiting list for an autism assessment, um, for 14 months. So I was initially referred, yeah, I know. Um, I was initially referred in September, 2018 and I literally just had my autism assessment on November 8th, uh, 2019. So, yeah, I found out I was autistic, age 25. Um, inter- Welcome to the club. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of my personal life, um, I have a first class uh, BA on uh, graphic design degree. Um, so I'm currently now a graphic designer full time um, and I work solo in-house at a cool company. Well, I kind of think so anyway. <laughs> um, and I really love my job as it gives my day sort of structure and routine. Um Yeah, so I've just got my little blog and my Instagram, which I've just been running since I was 21, um, just sharing my kind of journey with sensory difficulties. And obviously now, um, since November, I've been sharing kind of my journey as an autistic person too. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. (laughs) Very cool. And um, obviously like being, so you were diagnosed at 25? Yes, I'm 25 now. So yeah, November 2019. Yeah. And that's very, that's very like, um, it hasn't been a long time since you've, since you've known that you're autistic then. No, like, how has that been? It's pretty recent. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's been almost like a kind of weight off my shoulders to know, because I think um, me and my parents have all, have always known that, you know, because of my sensory difficulties, I'm a little bit different, which, you know, isn't a bad thing, but um, I've always sort of struggled with things. And um, I saw a psychologist um, the year before who said that actually 
they thought I might be autistic as I was displaying some sort of autistic traits. So that's when I thought I was kind of 24 when I first thought, oh, actually, I might be autistic. So that's kind of what kicked off the process for me. So, yeah, I guess I'm kind of late in diagnosis. Um, but obviously, I kind of knew from a young age that I was quite a sort of sensory being. So and so did my parents. So it's always kind of been on my radar, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I get that. And um, it's, uh, I, I definitely, because I, I, I was diagnosed around um, the age of 10. So okay. I was diagnosed at 10 years old uh, with Asperger's. And I'm guessing that you have Asperger's as well, right? Or My, I mean, my official diagnosis is just sort of autism, because actually what I didn't realise was um, at my assessment, my assessor said that they don't actually... Um, diagnose Asperger's anymore they don't use yeah. that term so I was like yeah. oh okay didn't know that <laughs> so I'd just kind of been told kind of autistic and then given a level of my mm-hmm. kind of like needs level if that makes sense so it, it, it sounds like the diagnostic kind of process has changed quite a bit um, yeah it's um I think it's something to do with the so there's like this uh diagnostic manual that a lot of yeah. like psychologists and stuff use I think mm-hmm. it's like in the DSM-5 yeah. they decided to get rid of all of that mm-hmm. and I don't I don't know I, f- I feel like it's I don't I don't understand quite what they're trying to do with that because <laughs> it makes no. it makes sense to have these separate separate sort of categories because mm-hmm. the difference between people you know, like a few years ago, the difference between people who have sort of classic autism are very, very, very vast in comparison to people with Asperger's and sure. people with things like PDD, NOS, mm-hmm. um, which is sort of very small amounts of traits of autism. Okay. And um, yeah, it, it just kind of boggles my mind, but. Yeah, it's <clears> weird that, you know, you you've been told you you have Asperger's but now it's not even diagnosed as or you know it's not even mentioned as that anymore it is weird how they've kind of changed that sort of thing and can like drop and add things as they like it is a bit weird yeah definitely but it does make it easier to say I'm autistic you don't have to like come up with a different word for uh but yeah cool and um you work at a so you work as in a graphic design Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a solo um, designer in house. So I work with a lot of engineers, which um, is is good. Um, they're quite logical and kind of analytical thinking and quite straightforward thinking, which is actually really good in terms of me being autistic and stuff. They're quite kind of I don't know the way that they explain things is very kind of matter of fact, which is really helpful for me. <laughs> straightforward, yeah, direct, exactly. So no it's quite good hidden meaning or yeah exactly all up front which is what I want <laughs> yeah I get that that must be it must be good that you've you know you found something that you are very passionate about and that yeah you're in a wet place that you don't feel out of place no I think the only thing I struggle with at my workplace is that it's an open plan office so that's that's my kind of in a terms of a pros and cons list that's the cons but otherwise it's all kind of pros so it's very hard to as a kind of sensory person find the like ideal workplace but I'm kind of trying to sort of manage if that makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and do they do they let you wear like noise cancelling headphones or anything yeah. to yeah they're good about that um they're quite I think like a lot of people kind of tend to go into their own zones and put their headphones on and stuff like that because otherwise you just can't concentrate I don't really understand the logic of an open plan office personally but <laughs> it's not great for concentration or if you're writing something but yeah noise cancelling headphones are are very handy <laughs> and you get some maybe some like desk dividers and yeah there's I'm kind of in one corner which works quite well um, oh that's nice yeah So they don't, my, I haven't actually told my um, work that I'm autistic. Um, I'm trying to decide whether or not to, because I've been there for two and a half years. And I don't know. I don't know if it would change their opinion on me. Obviously, you know, it's confidential and it, you know, it shouldn't change their opinions on me. But I do wonder what my manager would think. So I'm currently, you know, because I'm quite, I've only just been sort of diagnosed in November. I'm kind of tossing up what whether or not to say anything (laughs) so yeah definitely yeah I'm not sure yet but 
I've kind of got, you know, um, I got my report through just before Christmas. So I could always kind of go to work with that and just say, look, these are, this is what I struggle with. Um, yeah. So currently trying to decide that. <laughs> yeah. And it can, it can be a little bit of a difficult thing mm. to do because you don't, because I think for, for a large majority of the people in the UK, they would be fine with it. And mm-hmm. But then you also have the other side where if you've already got the job and you've been working yeah. for this amount of time and you're finding it all right, mm-hmm. is there anything really that you could, that that's you'd what, like to change? Yeah, that's what I'm not sure. And I'm not really sure in terms of accommodations, what they could kind of, you know, add in that, unless they gave me my own office, which would be great, but I don't see that happening. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. So it's, you know, I mean, I think if I changed jobs, I would definitely probably kind of say um from the beginning sort of thing but because I kind of just had sensory issues it's when I started though that's a lot more difficult to explain than being autistic I'm finding having the diagnosis of being autistic is is a much quicker way of summing up my issues um so yeah if I start somewhere different I think I would be upfront about things yeah cool so why have you chosen to be an influencer like is there anything in particular that that drove you to making your Instagram account and doing your podcast and doing your blog? Because it's a lot of commitment. It is, yeah. Um, It's difficult because I'm not sure I ever like actively chose to be an influencer or even if I'm like an influencer now, but I just sort of fell into it like through my blog. Um, So when I was 21, I decided that I was going to start a a blog about all my kind of sensory issues and just kind of daily living with sensory stuff. Um, And I thought, because whenever I used to sort of Google stuff about kind of sensory issues, it used to always come up with like children and toddlers and it was all very kind of American based, which is fine. I obviously don't have a problem with that, but you know, these sensory children and toddlers, they grow up to be sensory teens and adults. And I just felt there was like a bit of a gap in the market in terms of support for, you know, those sensory beings that, you know, grow up and continue to, you know, try and cope in this world. So that's why I sort of decided that I'd start my blog and just maybe fill in the gap of, you know, I'm a sensory person and I've grown up <laughs> and here's how I'm living sort of thing. So then I sort of went on from my blog to start an Instagram and kind of went on from there, I guess. But yeah, I just want, um, I just kind of decided to start it because I wanted it to be recognised that you, you, you don't grow out of this sort of thing. It's not, yeah. you know is something that you deal with and you cope with for the rest of your life. And, you know, you might get better at kind of coping with things, but um, not if you can't read about it online and things. So I think awareness is getting better, but yeah, you know, certainly when I was 21, there wasn't a lot out there. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it would be, it must be nice for people to, you know, see your channel and um, just, just going, going on the fact that you've, you know, you've gone, you've gone through a large majority of of your life with these issues or differences and you've got a job and you settled down and I think do you think that there are many people out there who find your stuff helpful and comforting to know about I think so I mean I was when I first started um my blog I used to get you know little comments here and there but now like on my Instagram I get a few messages a day from people who just stumble across my stuff and say you know I can really relate to this and it's lovely to hear because when I was 21 I didn't I didn't know anyone who struggled with sensory stuff and just to hear from people saying oh I'm like that or yeah I find brushing my teeth hard or something simple like that it's like yes someone else gets it so it's nice. It brings a smile of, to your face. Yeah, it just brings like, I don't know, a sense of community and that it's not just you struggling, which is really nice in terms of, you know, finding a community. Mm. Uh, what do you hope to help to do with all of, all of this stuff? I guess just continue to raise awareness of things. And I think now that I know I'm autistic, I'm, I've sort of starting to... I don't know, share my kind of journey. I've just written a big kind of blog post about kind of start to finish of my kind of process of being diagnosed. And 
I feel like a lot of people these days are getting diagnosed quite late in life, sort of 20, 30s, even like 40s, you know, year old people who are, you know, just realising, oh, actually, I might, you know, be autistic. So I think just raising more awareness of, you know, sensory things and that it's it's okay sort of thing. Um, And I think also I get messages from from um, parents who kind of I wasn't even kind of aiming to sort of help children and toddlers if that, that it sounds bad but obviously they have a lot of kind of stuff on the internet already but I get, yeah they've got a large yeah, sort of market I get a lot of messages from parents saying oh you know my toddler can't speak yet but what you're just, what you're kind of sharing kind of shows me what they might grow up into or what they might be feeling or you know what they can't get into words which to me was like really amazing I was like oh I wasn't even kind of looking to hit that sort of demographic but actually you know you, you don't think about it but you know children you know don't have the best sort of you know verbal kind of language do they so yeah and also being being on the spectrum as well like mm. it's it it's a significant sort of dampener on communicating socially yeah. how you're feeling and mm-hmm. yeah I, I understand that and I think having having a parents having someone like yourself to mm-hmm listen to and and hear about what it could be like for their children it must be really great for them as well yeah and that's something I never even considered that you know it might be helpful for them to see oh actually you know they might grow into this or this is what they're you know coping with at the moment but they can't get into words so yeah it is it's nice to know (laughs) yeah it it definitely brings a smile to my face like (laughs) (laughs) it's it's lovely it's lovely because obviously a lot of this stuff is for the for the most when you when you start off and mm-hmm. when you when you're in that phase of growing uh your your medias and your your channel and your podcasts and stuff there's a little bit of a it's you put a lot of your time into it yeah and there's not there's not there's not much monetary return but a lot of a lot of the things a lot of the the benefits of it come from knowing that you are actually making a making a difference and yeah improving things for people exactly i think that's great that's really awesome <laughs> so yeah you you have sensory processing disorder that was the first thing that you were diagnosed with yeah um what kind of sensory difficulties do you have or did you have that they sort of picked up on and how would you explain them to people who who don't you don't have any sort of differences in their sensory profiles? Um, so I guess kind of from the beginning, it's kind of the whole sensory processing disorder thing. It kind of exists when like sensory signals aren't like detected or they don't get organised into sort of appropriate like responses in your head. So professionals sort of explain that like SPD is a bit of a like a neurological traffic jam sort of in your head. So like certain parts of the brain um, kind of from receiving the information need to needed to interpret the sensory information correctly so that sort of means that a person with sensory processing difficulties finds it difficult to process um, any information received through their senses so for me things like sort of any of my sort of five main senses so things in terms of noise I find quite difficult or um, sort of unexpected touch and that sort of thing it can be quite overwhelming and like sometimes can kind of cause me to have a bit of a sort of sensory meltdown. Um, so it, it's quite, it's hard to explain to someone who is neurotypical that, you know, your senses are just heightened all the time. They don't, you can't switch them off sort of thing. They're just always on mm-hmm. and they're always running sort of really high and everything is kind of overwhelming to some extent and obviously you get sort of good days and bad days um and different things affect it um but I would say there's kind of you know the 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 main sort of senses such as like kind of touch can be really difficult in terms of a kind of light or kind of unexpected and it's it's stuff that people don't really consider in everyday life. So like, for example, if someone like pats me on the shoulder at work or something to get my attention, like that is really overwhelming for me. But to feel a rush of adrenaline. Yeah, exactly. Like you say, 
Ooh, but, I didn't expect <laughs> that. Just, uh... <laughs> but to someone who's neurotypical, they, they're literally just trying to get my attention. And you're like, mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's not okay. You've set me over the edge. But they're just like, you know, Emily, I need to ask you a question. <laughs> so <laughs> it seems it's like a really basic thing, but it's so overwhelming and it's really hard to get that across. So yeah, um, it is hard to explain. And, you know, some days I might deal with that better than others, depending on like my mood and stuff like that. So how much sleep you've had, whether yeah, you've had exactly. any so, energy drinks or anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of the same as everyone, you know, people, you know, if they haven't had their caffeine or enough sleep and stuff like that, then, you know, mood can be, you know, affected. But the same with kind of coping with sensory things, you know, if you're not feeling 100%, then, you know, it's going to, things are going to get to you and overwhelm you quicker than they might on a good day sort of thing. So, yeah, it is a weird one <laughs> to explain. And um, I think one of one of the most difficult things of trying to explain is, you know, there's a lot of things out there for autistic, specifically autistic children mm -hmm. that are inherently quite stimulating sensory wise. Mm -hmm. So like there's there's videos of, you know, we, we even have like therapy at the school that I work at where okay. they'll you know, give the children like pressure massages or mm -hmm. um, have this little box where there's loads of lights and mirrors and noises and sounds. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I think so sometimes, sometimes it's hard to, oh, there's a bit of sensory feedback there. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear myself a little bit. Oh. Right. We'll, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll run with it. Okay. Um, but as I was saying, yeah, sensory seeking, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that there is quite a big difference between having sensory difficulties. So the difficulties of going out in everyday life, like walking down the street, mm -hmm. having all the people around talking, passing by, some maybe sometimes bumping into you a little bit. Yeah. Um, the lights, the noise of the buses, having to concentrate on a lot of different things. There, there is a big difference between that and for example listening to some really loud music yeah or watching something on a video that's quite you know sort of flashy and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff um I think sometimes it's hard for people to get their head around why we like touching things like touching soft things and looking at yeah nice lights and stuff even though we get overwhelmed by our senses as well mm -hmm. do you do you ever find that you you have sort of a sensory seeking sort of um aspect to it I think yeah like you say you can have like sort of sensory seeking but you're also sort of sensory defensive at the same time and yeah sometimes I'll be like seeking stuff like you know like fidget toys or you know some sort of kind of I don't know sort of stimulating thing like a kind of like optical light or something like that or like um even just like for Christmas I got some sort of like bubble timers and they're quite kind of mesmerizing to sort of watch so I think I do I do have that kind of seeking aspect but I'm mainly quite a sensory defensive person but then mm -hmm. I know some autistic people who are majorly sensory seeking and you know not that sort of sensory defensive so again it's kind of I don't know you, there's a spectrum of autism but also kind of a you know not everyone is as seeking as each other if that makes sense yeah yeah I get that and I think depending on the person that that sensory profile can be completely different mm -hmm. so I'm I'm quite like sensory defensive like yourself I find okay. busy places difficult uh, but I only find them difficult when there's a lot of different sensory things going on at the same time mm -hmm. and I can't control it that's that's the thing that I find the most difficult okay but if I if, I, if I'm going into if I'm listening to some let's just say like heavy metal or something that I like I like a bit of heavy metal nice um <laughs> that's a lot of noise <laughs> and I usually have my headphones quite quite high and stuff and 
it it does sometimes baffle me that I I gravitate towards things like that. Mm-hmm. But I think it's it's because it's just one noise, just one yeah. input. If it's like a consistent that, noise, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah, like white noise or mm-hmm. any anything like that. I I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, my 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 sensory profile is pretty much um heightened senses so hypersensitivity in pretty much everything okay. uh, apart from my uh my movement my spatial awareness okay so it just means that i get i overwhelmed very easily mm-hmm. but i'm also extremely clumsy and i always okay. <laughs> injure myself on passing objects mm-hmm. No, I know what you mean. They're like shoulder, <laughs> shoulder barge, a lamppost. <laughs> it's when Say you sorry. find like bruises on yourself. You're like, how have I done that? Like, <laughs> Yeah, just found like a massive gash on your arm. You're yeah. just like, what? <laughs> uh, what? What have I done to do this? Yeah, no, I get what you mean. Cool. So yeah, sensory profiles it can be very, very difficult. And it's, it's hard to find a real way of explaining it to people. Mm-hmm. Um. I have searched a little bit and there's something that I came across recently called the autism reality experience. Okay. And hope, hopefully, hopefully, um, I'll be able to get them on the podcast at some point, mm-hmm. but they, they do these sort of training courses where they teach people about what it's like to be autistic. And they have these rooms that they set up that are basically designed to make people very sensory sensory overloaded so i think if i was to go into it it would just instantly flick some kind of like cortisol boost in my system (laughs) just make me make me very stressed out but for neurotypicals it sort of simulates what it what it is like we get them to do very simple tasks while they're being bombarded with everything from all different directions and stuff and I found that very cool yeah just to kind of be put in someone else's shoes actually is yeah. quite an interesting concept yeah definitely and it, this I've, I've searched high and low for something like that and I happened to come across it by chance um oh, I have to have a look so into hopefully it. yeah yeah definitely and I'm hoping that I can go down at some point to sort of shoot a video with them and mm-hmm try my best to go into that room maybe yeah. I wonder what that'd be like you know <laughs> yeah and I know there's like things on you videos on YouTube that try and mimic it and stuff mm. and I find them absolutely intolerable intolerable yes. horrible yeah but um there are there are great ways of trying to explain it it's just very hard to verbalize yeah what it's like yeah definitely so yeah, you have a different sensory profile. Mm-hmm. How how does it affect how you live your life? Like how does it affect your work and your social life and and all of that? I think since kind of sort of uni sort of days sort of from kind of 1920 onwards, I've sort of learnt to say no to a lot more things and I think I'm still learning that because like obviously in the most sort of polite way possible because I feel like I get burnt out and overwhelmed so easily just from sort of one social event, you know, if it's more than one or two people, you know, at a time um, or a group socialising, it just drains me so much. And the next day I tend to have um, something that I sort of refer to as like a sensory hangover. Um, Yeah. Obviously not anything to do with alcohol but I'm just using the the term hangover but just like describing me kind of being really physically tired kind of mentally drained and just sort of spaced out after having such like a kind of like intense sort of sensory like social event you know because it can be really noisy it can be crowded it can be kind of overwhelming and I've sort very of, taxing yeah exactly and I've sort of become a pro at like locating toilets as soon as I get to these sort of <laughs> me too yeah because you're like I just want to escape for five and kind of get myself back a bit and then go back out but it's sort of these things that you learn when you get older like oh 
I'm just going to pop to the loo because that's, you know, it sounds normal, doesn't it, to your friends, to your mates? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just going to pop to the loo. But actually, I'm not going to the loo. I just want to go sit in the quiet for five minutes. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think I, I think I'm kind of slowly learning that it, you know, it's okay to say no to things and to kind of, you know, it's difficult because you want to be included in everything. You don't want to miss out. But again, you, there's only so much you can do without, you know, overwhelming yourself and I think you know a lot of it is kind of masking like you know when you're out and about you've got to kind of put on this mask or this act of you know you're enjoying yourself but actually it's you know it's a lot of effort to keep up a kind of act of you know I'm okay I'm managing when actually you get home and you're a bit kind of just pooped from it like a runner marathon yeah exactly so Mm -hmm. yeah it sounds like you get what I mean (laughs) Yeah, I do. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, um, so, so I used to um, do uh, taekwondo. Okay. So I, I used to go to competitions. I used to fight and stuff. And if, if you, do, you haven't been to one before, taekwondo halls, the places where they have it, the sports halls, mm-hmm. are some of the worst places for sensory overloads Okay. In the world, bright floodlights, <laughs> lots of people everywhere, lots of mm-hmm. people talking, lots of beeps and okay. all of it that stuff. It must be stuff. quite it's... echoey and kind of noisy. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Very <okay>. disorientated. <laughs> and it's for a long time. Mm-hmm. These competitions go on for like eight to ten hours. So it's. Wow. And did you find that, that sensory stuff affected your performance in terms of the sport? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's Definitely. interesting, isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, situations where it is difficult. Mm-hmm. It was difficult for me. Uh, it still is to some extent, but I sort of... I know, I know, like, the ratio of going out and doing things that could possibly be busy mm-hmm. in, a, in a busy place to sitting on my own and chilling i think i've the more that i've got older the more that i've got a feel for the how much i can do really in the week um obviously like some of my friends they like to go out and do stuff and they like to to go to places sometimes that a little bit too busy for me and i just prefer to to stay in so we, we sort of switch it up and have a bit of a compromise and we go to places, restaurants or places that aren't too um, noise heavy okay, that we know, good. which is nice. It's nice that, that my friends can do that. Um, but I, I think, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, just being able to hear your friends in like a yeah, restaurant. as well. Yeah, it's such a nice thing. Like, I don't understand why you'd go out and have to shout at your friends because it's so noisy. So I get what you mean. Just going somewhere that's quieter so you can actually hear and, like, actually have a conversation. (laughs) Yeah, and I don't know whether you've got this, you get this as well, but um, my voice is very, very quiet. It's almost like just one or two levels under how people you how loud people's voices usually are okay so sometimes it can be hard for people to understand what i'm saying right and i think i think of think at some having it having a little bit of a thought experiment about it mm-hmm. um maybe maybe it's because my ears are quite hypersensitive and okay. if i if i reach the volume that all my friends tend to reach it like it affects me <laughs> My own voice like overloads me if I'm too yeah, loud. That's interesting. Have you ever found anything like that? Or? I think so. I get what you mean. Like you don't, you sort of, you sort of pitch your own level to suit you, sort of thing. So yeah. I think yeah, I'm quite sort of naturally softly spoken, and mm-hmm. I can find other people's volume quite kind of overwhelming. You know, say in a meeting at work or something, I'll think you know, oh actually they're much louder than I am. Is that, mm-hmm. you know, just, is that just me thinking that or <laughs> I get what you mean? Yeah. And sometimes it can be a bit difficult, especially for my friends, um, some of my friends in the South as well, because I have a tiny bit of an accent, tiny bit of a Northern accent. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's that much because for some reason 
Harrogate tends to be a bit more southernly spoken okay. in comparison to like surrounding areas, but the accent in combined with the the, lo- the low volume can be a bit <laughs> difficult for some of my friends. But okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's also I think also there's as well as trying to balance the sensory stuff, there is an aspect of I think as you said you 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 suffer with depression mm-hmm. as well yeah and i i have i i have similar things i have anxiety and depression and i i feel like i'm in a constant not battle but i'm in a constant mm-hmm. shifting of um priorities so if i sort of try and manage my anxiety staying a bit more yeah. um try not to be surrounded by as many sensory things, many social things. And because I do that, my depression gets worse because I'm more isolated and I'm on my own and I'm not around my friends and vice versa. So it's, have you ever found that you you have to sort of try and find it, find a golden, golden ratio of that stuff? Definitely. And it's a lot of kind of, I don't know, keeping up appearances across it all because like you say if you kind of tend to one thing like your anxiety like your mental health might get a bit worse and you might find you're getting kind of more episodes of depression and stuff and yeah like you say like kind of even just sensory wise you know you might need some time out and some time at home but then you feel like you'll get you're kind of kind of isolated so it's I don't know it's a weird cycle of kind of of you know you kind of want to be with people but you don't and (laughs) you you don't really know how to help yourself sometimes yeah definitely (laughs) and it's 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 also just dependent on the cycles of your mood as well Mm. right some some weeks you'll be less anxious some weeks you'll be incredibly anxious some weeks it'll be all right yeah and you have to so I think sometimes I have to push myself a little bit into it yeah. And when, when, usually when I go out from, you know, maybe just spending a little bit more time at home um, and chilling a bit more, going out into a busy place, I think for like maybe like an hour, an hour and a half, that that period of time is very difficult, very like overwhelming. I sort of, I sort of compare it to being in, being in like, do you know like one of those dog dog pounds? The the yeah yeah um, yeah, and what walking between these two like long cages, the ones that you yes. see in movies, yeah, and dogs just like barking at you and getting your attention and making different yeah, noises. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I feel like after going out into, <laughs> especially especially like a city or something. Mm. Like God forbid, that's. Um, <laughs> Can't deal with cities. Lived in one for four years, but... Impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Can't deal with cities. No, I get you. Much prefer to sort of try and take the uh, the non-main road routes. Yeah, towns over cities, definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, do you think... So this is a bit of a different one. Do mm-hmm. you think there are any benefits to having a different sensory profile because obviously you have a lot of you do a lot of art and you you got a first class in I did in graphics design which well done thank you like (laughs) that must have been very you know like very you know hard work and stuff so it's amazing that you you got such a great result from that (laughs) but yeah um sensory like does it affect your work I think it does I think I have this ability to sort of hyper focus on things and kind of I don't know get into this kind of work focus mode where I can just kind of do things and not realize time passing Um, workflow yeah just I think I have that sort of focus if I'm passionate about something so something like graphic design and I chose a uni course that was just coursework because that I loved coursework at kind of a levels and GCSEs but I was always really bad at exams because it was kind of on the day, spur of the moment, remember stuff. Whereas coursework, you could take the time and the kind of effort and 
I was always much better at kind of doing that sort of thing. And I think my sort of sensory sort of profile kind of helps in that because I can just, I can focus on things. Whereas, you know, my friends will be doing all nighters like the week before the deadline, but I'll I'll already sort of be done and kind of have done even more than I, you know, gone over, you know, what I needed to do and done, you know, more because I take the kind of time and I like to prioritize things earlier. So I feel like I'm quite an organized person in terms of my work and usually kind of, I don't know, at uni, you know, there's that kind of, kind of, I don't know, concept that, you know, most people are doing things last minute, but I'm not that sort of person. So I think in that way that, yeah, it's kind of helped me. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah. I, I, I was very organized my first year, but mm-hmm. like my, my, the years after that, I was absolutely terrible for organizing myself. Um, so well done for that. Like, <laughs> Most of my work was exam based and okay. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I hated it so much. It was, it's terrible. Cause I think also with exams, you've, you've got that aspect of uh, not knowing exactly what they want mm. you to put down. So I can, I can read papers and I can look at mark schemes, mm-hmm. but as soon as a new question comes up, I think of, a million different possible ways of which they want me to answer a question and it's just processing oh. what they actually want you to to mm. you know yeah they're, they're not specific enough no. are they and they're the just... questions I, I always used to have to highlight the bits I'm like what are they actually asking me <laughs> <laughs> just just uh rant off into some philosophical yeah. debate about <laughs> exactly which, which is I'll about... go off on one and then go back to the question and realize mean? Oh, actually, that's not what it was asking, and I'll be like, ah. So, yeah, no, yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, do Do you find that that you have more of an attention to to detail? Mm. Do you find that you get inspired by by things and can pick out little different ways of doing things? And I think so. Anything. Yeah, I think just in terms of design as well, I'm quite a kind of I can pick up on things. Um, the only thing that sets me back is because I'm dyslexic. I won't see spelling mistakes and things, but otherwise mm. in terms of design and images and kind of layout and stuff like that, I can pick up on stuff quite well. It's just my kind of dyslexia that sets me back, especially like at work, if I'm designing something for like a banner stand or something, I'll I'll try and get someone else to proofread it because I, I just don't see the spelling mistakes and I'll, I'll use spell checker and stuff, but you know, that doesn't get everything sometimes. So yeah there's yeah. there's things that you know are my strengths and that you know definite weaknesses but I just try and put things in place like you know saying to someone else look can you just have a look at this for me <laughs> so yeah because I know that um I the one one thing that sort of boggles me about autism in general is that mm-hmm. you can have I'm not I'm trying not to use the word spectrum but well, one end of, the end of the spectrum, you can have these hyper analytical, mm. completely logic driven people who do like stats and maths yeah. and science at such a, a massive level that's unbelievable. And then you can also have people at the right opposite end of the spectrum again, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who um, who are just amazingly creative, and it's it's. It, it sort of boggles me a little bit on that front. And I'm not sure whether it's to do with differences in senses or mm-hmm. or whether it's just, I don't know. It's weird. It's, I... it's difficult, yeah. Because yeah. it's always been in the diagnostic manuals and stuff that we have sort of a restrictive imagination. Mm. And yet we produce things like, especially you, like producing things that, are, are amazing like thanks <laughs> I think yeah we're all kind of wired so differently and I know that's not exactly the most kind of like I don't know um do- like a doctor wouldn't say that but I think we are kind of all our brains are just that slightly differently kind of set up um so even if we are kind of dealing with sort of a neurological traffic jam as they say you know actually we are we have real strengths in other places 
So yeah. Um, so yeah, we talked a little bit about the benefits and a little bit about your sensory profile as it affects you. Um, what changes have you made in your life to alleviate these um, sensory related stresses? I know we've touched a little bit about social events and stuff, but is yeah. there any specific like little things that you do just to set yourself at ease? That's a really good question. I think I think I do just try and take sort of more breaks kind of daily and things like that and I don't know even if I'm just say I'm at work or something and the office is just getting a bit too noisy I know that I can take myself off out of the office into our little sort of cafe area or even to the toilets and I know that I'll feel better for doing that I'll feel better for taking a break having like five minutes out and then I can kind of come back into the office and kind of get back to work again so I've kind of I think also since my diagnosis of autism, um, I've learned to be kind of less sort of harsh on myself because, you know, Mm -hmm. everyone else is, you know, working throughout the day and, you know, not getting up from their desks. But I just, I can't do that. I think in order for me to work better and, you know, do as much work as, you know, other people perhaps, that I've got to take those regular breaks or that time out from the noise and stuff like that. So, I think I'm just kind of learning to adapt to where I'm working or the environment and stuff. And likewise, you know, going out or meeting different people and stuff like that. It, I've just got to go at my own pace. And I think I'm learning more about my own pace. Um, whereas before I was quite, I was quite hard on myself. I was like, you know, why, why can't I do mm-hmm. what everyone else is doing? Um, but yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you, you see people around doing things that, mm to you just look like really stressful and yeah socializing you know maybe they're a bit of a socialite and they go partying all the time and Mm -hmm. they're always around people all the time in the houses they're never on their own and then you also have people who will just go through the daily just go through the day just sort of living out sort of a normative lifestyle Mm -hmm. like not really deviating from you know go to work in the morning, have some breakfast, go to lunch, yeah, talk to some people, come back home, talk to your girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, family, and then go to sleep after watching some TV. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like some, sometimes I feel like if I can't do that, I, I am also quite hard on myself in that way. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there is... It's not it's not necessarily an expectation from other people. It's just I want to be able to do what other people do. Yeah. And you compare and can. yourself as well. You yeah. think, Oh it's so easy to compare yourself and we shouldn't, but you think, Oh, if they're doing it <laughs> you just I don't Definitely. know. You, it's annoying. <laughs> I get that. So you you found that taking breaks and stuff can be mm. very helpful. And then I know we've talked a little bit about the fidget toys and the mm-hmm. um, headphones and stuff. Those are all great ways of helping with sensory difficulties um, in adults, of course. Yeah, there's there's different things that you can try. Um, one of the things that I've come across recently mm-hmm. is this company called Fidget Bomb. Oh, I think I saw your video. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping. I'm hoping to uh, have the have them on the podcast. Um, oh, cool. Think think tomorrow. Actually, I don't know. Okay. Um, but it will be uploaded like a little, little bit later. But mm-hmm. yeah, they they make these. It's, I can't really describe it. It's the best way that I could describe it without showing someone would be a bed sock. Okay. So it's sort of like a a thing that you put around your mattress and you zip it up at the side and then you get in it and it's just this it's this uh, sort of pressurized stretchy fabric okay so it's kind and of like a tight sleeping bag around you but kind of over your mattress yeah okay. and it's it's easy to get out and you can it's it's very different to like these weighted blankets that you have where mm. you feel sort of it's a bit muggy and warm and stuff and yeah i sleep with one every night but in the summer i, just, I can't <laughs> yeah so something like exactly, that might work yeah. better yeah 
I find sleeping really hard and Mm -hmm. I I have to at least toss and turn like a lot. And I think that that's a big part of sensory stuff for me as well. Mm -hmm. Like trying to wind down. Yeah. I have to stretch. I have to, I can't, so I can't sleep in one position and then fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I can't like lay in one position. Conk out. It's it's not never like that. It's always I've got to change position about twenty times. Okay. Stretch a few times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. I do envy those people that can just fall asleep, like <laughs> just, just fall Straight asleep out, yeah. like that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I tried weighted markets and stuff, but this it's it's really cool and it helps me a lot. It's just like the whole uh, pressure thing. You know, like pressure being quite a big mm-hmm. way of alleviating tension for autistic people. Definitely. That I found that, that that has helped quite a bit. Slept in it two nights so far. Mm-hmm. Both nights really nice. I can sort of lift my legs up if I want as well, just mm-hmm. sort of bend them. That's puts good. a bit more pressure on my legs and stuff, which is nice. It sounds less restrictive as well than yeah, like a weighted blanket where you are you're sort of caught in one position and you have to lift it up every time you turn so that does sound quite good yeah it's it's really nice and i think with with any sort of sensory differences normal things can be more difficult mm-hmm. and i think sleep is one of those things as well so we talked a little bit about what changes you can make things that you can do the benefits all that is there anything that other people can do? Mm-hmm. Is there anything that larger society or companies can do to <laughs> coax autistic people in? Yeah, I think I think we're going in the right way in terms of I don't know if you've heard about the like the sunflower like lanyard schemes yeah, and supermarkets and a stuff little like bit. that. Um, I don't. It's I don't know how I feel about it, but I feel like it, it is a step in the right direction in terms of you know. I'm not sure if we should be kind of, you know, I can see that, you know, wearing the lanyard might kind of highlight to someone that you might need some help, but I don't know in terms of, you know, having someone come up to you and talk to you, if that would be helpful or just, you know, you know, helping someone to be redirected around a store. But I think the more aware sort of neurotypical people are, the better, you know, things will become, you know, things like loud, repetitive noises, unexpected touch, new food, strong smells, like that list is just goes on and on. And I don't think people realise that these things make us quite uncomfortable and overwhelmed. And I feel like companies are maybe just starting to jump on to that sort of thing. Um, I don't think they've got it quite right yet. But you know, I've seen a lot of talk about like these lanyards and stuff online and, you know, what is, you know, how helpful can someone be in a supermarket? But I think, you know, just that there's more awareness is a good thing. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about it. I think that it's it's nice that they're trying to do something, but I feel like that yeah. lanyard thing is, is geared more towards like going back to pre um, DSM-5 more classic autistic people Mm -hmm. you know people who are a bit more low functioning yeah um in terms of people who are more high functioning i don't think there is much that that companies and stuff can do with that i think the main source of um comfort is having people around you that understand that areas are difficult like it can be very endearing, like very nice to hear when someone will turn to you, like in a busy restaurant mm-hmm. or in a busy part of town, one of you, one of your friends turn to you and say, are you all right? It's a bit busy and noisy in here. It's like just little things like that, just make it, mm. just make it not easier yeah. and you don't feel like you're on a complete different wavelength to everybody. Um. Yeah, just just mm-hmm. nicety, really, human niceness towards each other and yeah, compromise. And I think, and like you say, just I I find like if someone asks me if I'm okay, I'll be like, yeah, I'm fine. But if someone was to say, you know, are you a bit overwhelmed at the moment? Should we go outside? Or 
you know the way people kind of say things you know rather than just saying oh are you okay if they're more specific say are you a bit overwhelmed or do you need to take five then I'll be more likely to kind of divulge some information so yeah just being nice to people like you say yeah, yeah. Is it, it can make and a really big if you kind of are difference. you know if, if anybody out there is listening and you do have friends or partners who are autistic sometimes yeah just letting them know that 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 you're thinking about them and not just going to places or social Mm. events completely ignorant of any sort of experience Mm. that we may autistic people may be having yeah just showing Mm. showing that common common niceness and asking questions about what what can be done better or differently just to accommodate a little bit more that stuff can go a long way definitely even if it's just going out doing something a bit busy going to a restaurant i'm sure many people um on the spectrum can cope with it if they know that they're going somewhere that's busy Mm -hmm. for you know a couple of hours an hour or so depending on the person um and then maybe doing something a bit more chilled out and less busy, less less noisy and stuff. I think all of that stuff can be really helpful, right? especially in terms of building a relationship with them as well. Because if you understand someone, someone's different experience, then, you know, you've got it spot on. Yeah, I massively. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. So this is, this is always a little bit of a difficult question because you'll have to think back at what we've talked about okay (laughs) Um, but what three things that we've mentioned or you've mentioned that um you think are most important to take away from this podcast just for anybody who's listening I think maybe both of us kind of saying that you know we, we come in all sort of different packages in terms of sensory seeking and sensory defensive you know no no two autistic people are the same or you know people with Asperger's like you're never going to have someone you're never going to find the same sort of autistic person so just understanding that we are all different and we kind of have our own different strengths and weaknesses I think that's one kind of main thing that I would take away um I'm trying to think as well another thing um I think maybe just kind of that one of the things I said was that you know um children and toddlers who are autistic or sensory they're gonna grow up to be autistic and sensory and you know just helping them to go through because childhood's difficult and you know adulthood is you know not plain sailing (laughs) um so you know just being able to support your child you know through that and you know like my parents have been super um supportive and understanding that's great to hear yeah and they know they know my strengths they know my weaknesses they know what I need help with in terms of living and stuff like that so that is great you know and I know not everyone has that and I know support services are a bit stretched in you know places like the UK so I know it can be difficult but if you can find a support network somehow I think that's really important in being able to cope as you know someone who is neurodivergent in the world um yes that's another thing I think I'd take away um last point last point oh good question um I don't know I think in terms of sort of like sensory aids it's it's definitely like worth looking around to see what works for you like you're saying about the fidget bum thing and me saying about weighted blankets and stuff it's it's worth trialing these things like um the company I got my weighted blanket from they gave me a trial with it so you know companies are understanding that you know we you want to test something out as a sensory or like autistic or a spurred you know you you want to you want to try something before you buy it and I know a lot of kind of sensory items are quite expensive and you know a lot of kind of people are making their own weighted blankets and stuff like that so there's different options and things but yeah I think things like that are really helping us cope in the world better you know helping us to get better sleep which is really important because like you say it's difficult to switch off at night you know your thoughts are like racing and yeah you you'd kind of fidget a lot and stuff like that so I think that's another thing I take away um yeah <laughs> I hope those were two um no those are brilliant <laughs> yeah brilliant 
And uh, obviously, uh, noise cancelling headphones. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, all those sort of sensory aids are so good. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd be able to function without them, to be honest. <laughs> Me neither. I, I sometimes even put them on in my own home. Yeah, like, I've got good. them on now. I'm listening to you with them with noise coming exactly. them now. It's like bliss, <laughs> like being on a beach. It's nice, isn't it? It's when you take it off and you're back in the real world, you're like, oh. <laughs> all this background noise. Yeah, you just don't realise. No, yeah. it's not. It's not quiet. <laughs> it's never noises. quiet. Never quite. <laughs> yeah cool um so this is the sort of last question something that i mm-hmm. ask everybody who comes onto the podcast well not everybody but specific people what does autism mean to you so i think it means that i'm different but not less so i have different strengths to sort of neurotypical people um and even though i do find things difficult to deal with in this like really sensory world um I'm learning every day to cope better with things and I also think autism to me is like a sense of community because we are I don't like to use the word spectrum or like scale but we are all on this kind of big kind of line and we're all so different but the fact that we can come together and support groups kind of in real life and online as well um which I think is really kind of taking off is like a really huge thing to me so yeah, I hope that's a, a good enough description of what it means. Yeah, to me. <laughs> the autism community. Yeah, it's brilliant. Good. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, I think that's the the end of the questions. Uh, do you want to give anybody, everybody, some links to follow up on? Anything yeah, sure. social media or? Um, yeah. So um, my Twitter and Instagram are the same. They're both at twenty one and sensory. And um, my blog is 21sensory.wordpress.com. So that's where you'll find me online. I'm kind of more, um, if you want to keep up with me more day to day, Instagram's probably the place to find me. <laughs> hmm. And you, you have a uh, sort of a link tree um, yes. link as well, where you have your podcast on there and stuff. So all of your stuff is very streamlined. I'd, well, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take some some tips from you. <laughs> You'll have to show me how to do that that link tree thing. Yeah, it's worth doing. <laughs> Definitely. Cool. Um, so, yeah, today we've talked a little bit about sensory things. Um, I hope that everybody out there has got something from this episode. Emily has, you know, Emily, you've been great. Um, and you've Thanks. you've given a lot of your own personal experiences, and mm-hmm. it's awesome to hear that you're in a in a good job, and mm-hmm. you're finding new things, and and that you're a part of the uh, the autism community now. So, yes. <laughs> very thankful for that. <laughs> Hooray! <Yeah. laughs> uh, if there's anybody out there who has any ideas for the podcast, anybody that you think would be good to come on. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe you have some some stories that you can offer. Um, anything like that, get in contact with uh, the email at Asperger's Grove. No, not Asperger's. Oh. <laughs> That's your social media. It's all good. <laughs> social media is at Asperger's Grove. Facebook, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram. Um, <laughs> yeah, get in contact with the email, Asperger's Grove at gmail.com. YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth, of course. And if you want to get in contact with me about anything, let me know on those those links. I'll put them in the, in the description along with Emily's links. But yeah, um, Emily, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been nice to just have a, um, a kind of nice chat. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Uh, Thank you very much for watching, everybody. And I will see you in the next episode of the 40 Orty Podcast. See you later, peeps. You can say goodbye as well, by the way. Bye, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) I always forget to mention that. I'm like, shall I be quiet? (laughs) Goodbye.